Hello, everybody. My name is Carol Bailey White, and I'm with Duval Audubon Society, which is a chapter of the National Audubon Society operating in Northeast Florida with members in Clay, Duval, and Nassau counties. This video was created in partnership with St. John's Riverkeeper, and the purpose is to show you the most common birds that you can find on or around the St. John's River. So we hope that if you're out on the river and you're wondering what bird you're seeing, this video may help. Keep in mind though that this is not an exhaustive list of every single bird that might be seen on the river. That would take way more time than we have. These are just the ones that are most commonly seen. A little bit about me. I started birding about 15 years ago with a friend who took me to some of Duval Audubon Society's bird walks. And over the years, I started to get hooked on birding. Duval Audubon's field trips were extremely helpful for me as a novice birder because all the field trip leaders were very generous with their knowledge and welcoming to new birders. So it helped me feel less intimidated because at the beginning, I knew almost nothing about birds. After a few years, I decided to get more involved and join the chapter's board of directors in 2013. I started out as the treasurer and did that for two years, then became the membership director for the next two years. For the past three years, I've been the vice president, webmaster, and social media director, and I'll be the president next year for the upcoming 2020-2021 season, which officially starts in September. Duval Audubon Society's mission is connecting people with nature, and I hope this video will help connect you with the birds of the St. Johns River. Our first bird is the belted kingfisher, also known as Kirby, the St. Johns Riverkeeper mascot. Belted kingfishers can be seen along the St. Johns River pretty much all year round. They're about 11 inches tall with distinctive blue, gray, and white coloring, a big head with a scruffy crest on top, and a heavy, sharp bill. They're quite energetic, flying from perch to perch along the river as they look for food. Belted kingfishers dive for their food, which is mostly fish, and they can briefly hover in the air like a giant hummingbird before diving down and grabbing their prey with their bills. Their rattling call is very distinctive. You've probably heard it before. Belted kingfishers are sexually dimorphic, meaning that the male and female of the species look different, either in size or plumage or sometimes both. The bird in the photo is a male with a simple two-tone color scheme. But unlike many bird species in which the male is the flashier one, the female belted kingfisher is more brightly colored than the male with a rusty red belly band, making it easy to distinguish between males and females. Fun fact, they nest in upward sloping burrows tunneled in sandy riverbanks. The burrows are usually about three to six feet long and both the male and female work on digging the nest burrow. Breeding season in Florida for this species and for most of the birds I'll be talking about today is generally spring and early summer. Next is the double crested cormorant. These are large water birds at around two to two and a half feet tall and they can also be seen year round in Florida. Their feathers have less waterproofing oils than other birds which allows them to dive underwater to catch fish and other small prey. Their webbed feet allow them to swim fast and chase fish underwater, and they can actually stay underwater for over a minute. After fishing, they have to dry out their wings before they can fly, as shown in the photo. Note the hooked bill, distinguishing them from the somewhat similar Anhinga. The Anhinga is another large water bird, similar to the Cormorant, but slightly larger and more slender, with a straight needle-sharp bill for spearing fish rather than the cormorant's hooked bill. They're often called the snake bird for their long S-shaped neck and their tendency to swim almost completely submerged with only their long skinny neck sticking out of the water. They're also sometimes referred to as water turkeys for their long turkey-like tail feathers. Like cormorants, they need to dry out their wings after fishing due to the lack of oils in their feathers. They're excellent at swimming and diving because they aren't waterproof like many birds and aren't as buoyant but it does mean that their feathers get soaked and they have to dry them out before they can take flight. The photo shows a male with a dark head, neck and body, and silvery feathers on the back of his wings. This photo shows a female anhinga or an immature male with light brown neck and head feathers. Anhingas nest in colonies alongside other water birds like herons, egrets, and cormorants. Our next bird is the great blue heron. 
These large birds are a common sight along the St. Johns River and along other waterways, lakes, ponds, and wetlands. They are the largest heron in North America with a height of up to four and a half feet tall and a wingspan up to six and a half feet. Their call is a raspy croak. Sounds prehistoric, doesn't it? Immature birds, like the one in the smaller photo, are browner and more mottled looking overall. They haven't yet developed the striking black and white head markings of adults. Their hunting strategy is to wade slowly in shallow water looking for prey, then strike lightning fast. They'll eat fish, amphibians, insects, snakes, even small mammals. I once saw a great blue heron eating a baby alligator. They nest in colonies and usually build stick nests high up in the treetops. The little blue heron is another fairly common sight along the St. John's River. Adult birds are a dark gray blue overall with a purplish tinge to the head and neck. First year birds are pure white and can easily be confused with other all white birds like snowy egrets and cattle egrets. But you can distinguish them by their greenish legs and also their two-tone bill, a feature unique to this species. It's been theorized that the all-white coloring of first-year birds may help prevent attacks from snowy egrets as they often feed alongside them. Snowies frequently show aggression towards the all-blue adults, but not the all-white first-year birds. During their second year, little blues transition from all-white to all-blue and show a mottled appearance during that time as they replace those white feathers. So you may see some that are part white and part blue. They use a similar stalking and striking feeding behavior as the great blue heron, but obviously eat smaller prey, like small fish, crustaceans, or insects. This species also nests in colonies, usually in low shrubs and small trees. Tricolored herons are somewhat less common along the St. John's than great blue herons or little blues, but they're still widely seen. They're about the same size as little blue herons, but are a bit stockier in build. Adults are similar in color to adult little blue herons, but can be distinguished by their all white belly and white neck stripe. They also have a longer bill than little blues. Immature tricolored herons have a more reddish coloring that will morph to the blue gray adult coloring in their second year. Their foraging style is much more active than great blue and little blue herons. They often run, turn, and stop quickly, then crouch down to stab their prey, which is usually small fish. They are another colonial nester with other herons and egrets, but again, they're somewhat less commonly seen. Green herons are fairly common along the St. John's River, but they can be harder to see thanks to their dark coloring and typical crouched posture. They're smaller and stockier than little blue herons with a height of about one and a half feet and wingspan around two feet. Adults have a rich cinnamon coloring on their neck and chest and dark blue-green feathers on their backs. Immature birds are much paler with dark streaking on their breast and speckling on their wings. Corvids like crows and ravens are well known for their tool use, but did you know that green herons also use tools? When hunting for food, they'll often drop insects, twigs, feathers, or even bread crust if they can find them to entice small fish. They sit completely still until their prey is in range and then strike lightning fast. Green herons sometimes nest in colonies but are usually solitary nesters. Next is the great egret. Herons and egrets belong to the same family, but the distinction between them is confusing, and many consider egrets to just be a type of heron. Egrets got their name from the French word aigrette, which means plume feathers. The National Audubon Society adopted the great egret as its symbol because in the late 1800s, their feathers were prized as fashion accessories. And as a result, this species was almost hunted to extinction. But thanks to the efforts of early conservationists, great egrets made an amazing comeback and are now quite common across coastal areas in the southeastern United States. Great egrets are slightly smaller than great blue herons, but are still impressive sized birds standing at about three feet tall with a wingspan of about four and a half feet. They employ the same kind of feeding strategy as the other wading birds, slowly walking through shallow water until their prey is spotted, then patiently waiting for just the right moment to nab them. They are colony nesters with other wading birds, and their chicks can sometimes be so demanding and competitive that stronger chicks have been known to stab weaker chicks to death. 
When this photo was taken, the chicks were crying incessantly to the parent for food, even though they had just been fed. The snowy egret is our next bird. They're now fairly common along the St. Johns River, but were also hunted almost to extinction in the late 1800s due to the huge demand for the impressive head plumes that they developed during breeding season, which were used to adorn ladies' hats. They have rebounded since then thanks to conservation efforts, but are now threatened by habitat loss due to development, like most of the birds on this list. Snowy egrets are much smaller than great egrets and can easily be confused with the similar sized immature little blue heron, but note the distinctive black bill and yellow feet, although their feet are not always visible because like most wading birds, they're often seen foraging in the shallows for prey, such as small fish, frogs, worms, crustaceans, and insects, and they use their feet to probe in the mud to stir up the prey. Snowy egrets are also colony nesters alongside the other wading birds like great blue herons, great egrets, and tricolored herons. Here is another white egret, the cattle egret. Cattle egrets are actually native to Africa, but they reached the South American continent in the 1870s, arrived in the United States in the 1940s, and have continued to expand northward. They can be found year round in Florida and are adapted to thrive in agricultural and even suburban areas. I've actually seen them foraging in the median on Southside Boulevard in Jacksonville, one of the busiest roads in town. They're often seen following cattle or horses around in pastures, grabbing frogs or insects disturbed by passing livestock. Cattle egrets are slightly smaller and stockier than snowy egrets at about one and a half feet tall and just under a three foot wingspan. And they're most often observed in a hunched posture when standing still. This photo is somewhat unusual in habitat and pose, but I believe this individual was just about to take flight when I took the picture. Their plumage is all white, but in breeding season, they develop golden orange feathers on their head, chest, and back. Note the thick yellow bill, distinguishing them from snowy egrets with their all black bills and immature little blue herons with their two-tone bills. Cattle egrets are the most gregarious of all herons and form dense breeding and roosting colonies. Here is yet another white wading bird, the white ibis. This one is a little easier to distinguish though due to its downward curving red or pink bill. The bill is used to probe for insects and crustaceans in shallow wetlands, soft muddy river or pond bottoms, and wet grassy fields. Fun fact, when baby white ibises hatch, their bills are straight. They don't start to curve downward until they're about two weeks old. Adults are pure white with black wing tips. Immature birds, like the one in the smaller photo, are mottled brown and white, developing their full adult coloration in their second year. They're often seen foraging and flying together in a mixed flock of adult and immature ibises. They're dependent on healthy wetland areas, but also can be seen foraging in neighborhoods, parks, or golf courses. As with most other wading birds, they nest in large colonies for safety. Next is the limpkin, a large wading bird about the same size as the tricolored heron and about two feet tall, but with a heavier build. They rely on freshwater habitats where apple snails, their primary food source, are common and are somewhat endangered due to habitat loss. Their long sturdy bill is bent and twisted at the tip, which is an adaptation that makes it easier to remove snails from their shells. Their U.S. range is exclusive to Florida. They're more common in southern and central areas, but are now regularly being reported in northeast Florida as well. They stalk their prey by slowly walking through shallow water to find snails and mussels. Unlike many of the wading birds, limpkins are solitary nesters. There is nothing quite like the haunting cry of a limpkin on the St. Johns River. Wood storks are the only kind of stork found in North America, and nearly all of them are in Florida. They're quite large at over three feet tall with a wingspan of over five and a half feet. They're easily recognizable by their sheer size, much bulkier than the more slender herons and egrets, and by their scaly looking heads. As adults, their heads and bills are mostly black, but in younger birds, their bills are lighter, as shown in the photo. Ungainly on land, they make up for it with their slow, graceful, and elegant flight. Seen from below, the easiest feature to pick out is their all-white plumage with stark black feathers all along the bottom edges of their wings. 
When resting, they usually stand in an upright posture like a couple of the ones in the picture. They often feed together in groups with other wood storks and can be seen with their heads down in shallow water, feeling for prey like fish, frogs, and reptiles. When they sense something with their bill, they quickly snap it shut and swallow the prey whole. Wood storks form huge nesting colonies in trees above standing water, especially in protected areas like wetlands. This photo was taken at a nesting colony located at the Jacksonville Zoo. This colony has been active at that location since 1999 and has been monitored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service since 2003. Wood storks are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act due to an estimated decline of about 75% from approximately 20,000 breeding pairs in the 1930s to estimates as low as 3,000 breeding pairs by the 1970s. Conservation efforts and legal protections have allowed them to recover somewhat, and the estimated number of wood storks in the U.S now stands at around 8,000 breeding pairs. So efforts to provide suitable habitat and protect them from disturbances have paid off. Next, we have a couple of common gallinules and an American coot, which are often seen foraging together in shallow wetland ponds. They swim like a duck and have long slender toes that allow them to walk on top of vegetation. Common gallinules are about a foot in length and their red head shield makes this bird fairly easy to see in wetland habitats. They often make soft clucking sounds while foraging. <laughs> Gallinules forage in shallow ponds for plants, insects, and snails, and nest on top of thick mats of vegetation near the water's edge. American coots are slightly bigger and plumper than common gallinules and have similar foraging and nesting habits. To me, they're sort of chickeny looking, especially on land, and their white bill makes them easy to distinguish. The wood duck is one of just a few wild duck species that stay in Florida all year round. They're also one of the most strikingly beautiful, especially the male. In the photo, the male can be seen in the front and the female behind. While the male is certainly the flashy one, I think the females are also quite beautiful with their muted coloring and striking facial markings. Both males and females are very distinctive and don't really look like any other duck, but they may be hard to see because they tend to be somewhat skittish, flying away with strident alarm calls if they are disturbed. Wood ducks are opportunistic feeders and eat plant matter like seeds, acorns, and fruits, but will also eat insects, snails, and caterpillars if available. Wood ducks are cavity nesters and will nest in natural tree cavities, sometimes as high as 60 feet off the ground, but will also readily take to nest boxes installed within 100 feet of water. They're one of the few duck species equipped with strong claws that can grip bark and perch on branches. When baby wood ducks are ready to leave the nest cavity, the mama duck calls to them from below and they climb up to the opening, leap out, and make their way to the water where they'll join their mother and siblings. Mallards are another wild duck species found in Florida all year round. Most other wild ducks only spend winters in Florida and migrate northward in the spring to their breeding grounds across the northern U.S. and Canada. Male mallards have a dark iridescent green head, a bright yellow bill, brown coloring on its breast and back, and black feathers at the rear. Females and immature mallards are mottled brown with orange and brown bills. Mallards are dabbling ducks and feed in the water by tipping forward and grazing on underwater plants. They'll also roam around on the shoreline picking at vegetation as well as small insects and earthworms. They're very common across the United States and unlike wood ducks have made themselves comfortable in city and suburban parks and neighborhoods anywhere there is a pond and will readily accept handouts from people. If you do like to feed ducks, please do not give them bread. Bread is like junk food to ducks, but it has little nutritional value and can actually lead to obesity, making it more difficult for them to evade predators. And it can also cause developmental problems like deformed feathers due to malnutrition. Instead, give them cracked corn, barley, oats, birdseed, or duck feed from a farm supply store. 
There are two kinds of crows that can be found in Florida, the American crow and the fish crow. Fish crows are somewhat more common along the St. Johns River, but both can be seen when you're out on the river. Even though fish crows at around 16 inches tall are actually smaller than American crows, which are about 20 inches tall, they look so much alike that it's nearly impossible to tell them apart just by looking at them. The best way to tell them apart is to listen for their call. The American crow's call is more of a hoarse croaking sound. And the fish crow makes a much more nasally call. Both species are very social and can often be seen in groups, sometimes in mixed groups of both types of crows, constantly calling to each other. Crows will often mob much larger birds like red-shouldered hawks and barred owls, harassing them mercilessly until they leave the area. Next is the boat-tailed grackle, which is more common near saltwater, but can be found along the St. Johns River, especially in marshes, parks, and at boat ramps. Males are quite large at more than a foot in length and glossy black with very long straight tails that they hold in a V shape like the keel of a boat. Females are quite a bit smaller, usually about 10 inches, with dark brown coloring on their backs and lighter streaky reddish brown on their neck and belly. They almost look like a completely different species. The eye color of boat tail grackles in Florida, both males and females, is typically brown. But boat tail grackles in other parts of the country can have light colored eyes as well. They eat a wide range of foods, including crustaceans, frogs, lizards, turtles, seeds, fruits, and tubers, and are also scavengers. They can often be seen foraging in dumpsters and fast food parking lots picking over discarded food. Boat tail grackles are very gregarious and noisy. Their screechy call will be familiar to many. They are colonial nesters, but have a harem mating system that is unique among North American birds. Individual males defend clusters of nesting females from other males, and only the highest ranking males, having established their status through displays and vigorous fights, get the chance to mate. The common grackle is the other type of grackle that can be found along the St. Johns River. It's much more common inland than boat tailed grackles, but similar enough in appearance that they're often confused. Common grackles are slightly smaller than boat tail grackles and usually have a light colored eye, as shown in the photo. Males have iridescent blue-black plumage with bronze tones in the right light. Females and immature birds are typically darker brown with less iridescence. Their call is a series of clucks, squeaks, and strident whistles. This is one of the best ways to make sure which grackle you're seeing. They've often been described as sounding like a rusty gate squeaking on its hinges. Common grackles are very communal birds and are often seen foraging together on lawns or fields or in large roosts and treetops. Their food is mostly seeds, grains, acorns, and fruits, and in breeding season, they'll also eat caterpillars, insects, crustaceans, fish, small frogs, mice, and even other birds. The red-winged blackbird is one of the most abundant birds in North America. It's very common in wetlands, marshes, and along waterways with areas of tall grasses and reeds. They're highly gregarious and are most often seen in large flocks. Red-winged blackbirds are about the size of a robin at nine to 10 inches in length. Males and females look markedly different. Males are all black and sport beautiful red and orange epaulets that get even brighter during mating season. Females, like the one in the smaller photo, are streaky brown, almost looking like a large sparrow. Males spend much of the breeding season sitting on a high perch over their established territories and singing their hearts out. Females usually stay lower in the reeds collecting food and nesting material. Their call is very distinctive and will probably sound familiar to many. Their diet consists mostly of insects, grains, and seeds. 
The bald eagle is an incredible conservation success story. Bald eagles almost went extinct by the 1960s due to hunting and pesticides, but with the banning of DDT and the inclusion of bald eagles under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1972, bald eagle populations have rebounded, and these majestic birds can be seen across the United States. Florida is only second to the state of Alaska in the total estimated number of breeding pairs, 1,500 according to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Bald eagles are one of the largest birds in North America, with a body length of up to three feet and a wingspan of up to seven and a half feet, with females typically a third larger than males. They're in a class of birds called raptors. These are birds with strong hooked beaks and powerful sharp talons. Raptors feed almost exclusively on meat, either taken by hunting or by feeding on carrion. Hawks, kites, owls, falcons, and vultures are also in this category. Bald eagles are very good hunters, but they're also well-known thieves and will often harass ospreys to steal their food. Their call is possibly not what you might think, considering that Hollywood typically uses the wrong sound for bald eagles. Here's their typical call. Bald eagles nest all along the St. Johns River, and nesting season here in Florida is from October through mid-May. When young bald eagles first leave the nest, they are completely brown. It takes about five years before they develop the distinctive white head and tail feathers of an adult bald eagle. The bird in the photo is probably about four years old, as its white head feathers have mostly come in, and you can see the white developing in the tail feathers. This points up an important point about bird identification. As we've seen in previous examples, birds don't look the same all the time. Sometimes the males and females look markedly different. Sometimes immature birds look very different from the adults. And sometimes birds look different at different times of the year. So it's important to be able to recognize the things that don't change, like overall size, general shape, and behavior. In the case of the bald eagle, one characteristic that distinguishes them from other birds that you might see in the sky is that they hold their wings out flat and straight when they're flying. So no matter what color they are, you can more easily recognize them. Our next bird is the osprey, which I'm sure many of you have seen. They're quite common all along the St. John's River and along with bald eagles have rebounded significantly since the 1970s. Osprey numbers had crashed when pesticides like DDT poisoned the birds and thin their eggshells. But after DDT was banned in 1972, their populations have steadily grown. Smaller than bald eagles with a wingspan of about four feet, ospreys are powerfully built raptors with strong grasping claws that can grab their prey, which is almost exclusively fish, right out of the water. Once they've caught the fish, they fly off with it to eat it on a nearby branch or take it back to their nest to feed their young. Light underneath and dark brown on top, they're easy to recognize by the dark stripe across their eye, and also by the way they hold their wings when flying, almost in a flattened M shape. Their call may be familiar. You've probably heard it when you're out on the river. Now this is a bird that's easy to recognize with its forked tail and striking black and white coloring. Swallowtail kites spend winters in South America, but return to their breeding grounds in Mexico and Florida, typically by March. They usually start migrating back to South America in August, so the time to look for them is spring and summer. Lucky folks might see them soaring in the sky, using their incredible tail to perform aerial acrobatics while hunting for prey, which is usually insects but they can also take frogs, lizards, snakes, and even nestling birds of other species, consuming the prey while flying. They catch it in their talons and bring it to their mouth to take a bite, all while on the wing. Swallowtail kites are smaller than bald eagles and ospreys, but still impressive in size at two feet in length with a three foot wingspan. They roost in big groups before migrating, usually in a remote stand of tall pines. I've never been lucky enough to see one of these roosts, but I've seen photos and it's a remarkable sight. 
Our next bird is the red-tailed hawk, which is probably the most common hawk in North America. This hawk can be seen all year round in Florida, but it's less likely in developed areas due to their preference for open habitat. You may see them along the river near fields and pastures though. It's one of the larger hawks at up to two feet tall with a wingspan of up to four feet. And like bald eagles, the females tend to be larger than the males. They're fairly easy to recognize in flight due to their rusty red tail feathers, but sometimes it's hard to see the color of the tail feathers. Another great field mark for red-tailed hawks is the dark belly band, which is pretty much unique to this species of hawk and can be seen even if the bird is perched. Red-tailed hawks do have a lot of color variations in different populations across the country. Some are much lighter than this and some are quite dark. The ones we see here in Florida are usually somewhere in the middle. They typically eat small mammals like rabbits and mice, but will also eat snakes and even other birds. Their call is often incorrectly used in movies and TV shows with bald eagle footage. This drives birders crazy. Red-shouldered hawks are often seen in developed areas as long as there are patches of woods. Somewhat smaller than red-tailed hawks, they're typically about one and a half feet tall with a wingspan of about three feet. They're called red-shouldered because they usually have reddish-brown feathers at the tops of their wings, like in the photo, but that's not always easy to see. The photo also shows the typical red-shouldered hawk color scheme. Their wings are dark and speckled with white. Their breast is usually reddish-brown with white barring, and their tails show dark and light banding. But in flight, you're not likely to see much of this, if any maybe the tail. The best way to ID a red-shouldered hawk in flight is to look for light-colored crescents near the tips of their wings. If you see that, you know you're looking at a red-shouldered. These hawks are sometimes quite vocal, calling over and over as they fly through their established territory. You've probably heard them more than once. Turkey vultures are one of the two vulture species that we have in Florida. They're carrion eaters and use their keen sense of smell to find roadkill or other dead animals to eat. They have been known to smell carrion from over a mile away. Their immune systems are quite robust and they rarely catch diseases from rotting meat, which to me makes them nature's janitors. I have a great appreciation for the natural services they provide. They're pretty easy to recognize. They don't have feathers on their heads, so you can see their bright red skin on their heads if you're close enough. They're quite large, almost as big as an eagle, and mostly black all over except for their heads. Turkey vultures are one of the easiest birds to recognize in flight. They usually hold their wings in a V shape, like in the photo, and they're kind of wobbly or teetery looking in flight. The other thing to look for is their lighter colored, silvery looking feathers all along the bottom edges of their wings. The other vulture species that we have in Florida is the black vulture. It's smaller than turkey vultures, but slightly bigger than a red-tailed hawk. Black vultures are also carrion eaters, but their sense of smell isn't anywhere near as sensitive as turkey vultures, so they usually find their food by sight. Although I've heard that they often follow turkey vultures around and let them find the food. I've seen them flying together, so this may be true. Their heads are featherless like turkey vultures, but covered in scaly black skin so they appear pretty much black all over. The lack of head feathers means they aren't getting their feathers dirty when they plunge their heads into a rotting carcass to eat. They're pretty easy to recognize in flight. They usually hold their wings slightly forward and the tips of their wings are a lighter silvery color underneath. If it wasn't for vultures cleaning up dead animals, we'd have rotting carcasses all over the place. So I think we owe vultures a big debt of gratitude. Laughing gulls are another common sight along the river, particularly in the lower basin near the mouth of the river where it empties into the Atlantic. Like egrets, their numbers were seriously depleted in the late 1800s due to the feather trade, but with protections, laughing gull populations have rebounded. The one in flight in the photo is in breeding plumage with a fully black head, but in the winter time and when they're youngsters, they can look quite different. The inset photo shows an immature bird on the left and an adult in non-breeding plumage on the right. So these birds can look very different depending on their age and what time of year it is. 
Laughing gulls are generalists when it comes to food. I'm sure you've seen them scavenging at dumpsters and grabbing french fries from parking lots. But they'll also eat worms, crabs, fish, squid, and even fruits and berries. During nesting season, they'll also snatch eggs from the nests of other species, anything to feed their hungry chicks. Huguenot Memorial Park in Jacksonville hosts one of the largest nesting colonies of laughing gulls and royal terns, which I'll talk about on the next slide, on the east coast of the United States. The beach at Huguenot is blocked off during the summer months so that laughing gulls and other beach nesting birds can raise their chicks without fear of being run over by cars on the beach. If you're out on any of Florida's beaches during the summertime, please be extra careful and don't let dogs or children run into the dunes or other possible nesting areas as many of our most endangered shorebirds nest either in the dunes or even right on the beach. The call of the laughing gull will probably be very familiar. It's obvious how they got their name. <laughs> the royal tern is another shorebird that nests along the coast but can regularly be seen on the river. They also form large nesting colonies, often alongside laughing gulls. In our area, the chicks usually hatch starting in late May and fledge in a little over a month. Royal terns fly about 30 feet above the surface of the water and look for small fish or shrimp, then plunge dive to seize their prey in their bills. When they're feeding young, they'll often forage far inland for food, so you'll probably see them more frequently along the river in the summer months. Although as with laughing gulls, they're commonly seen at all times of the year in the lower St. Johns River Basin near the mouth of the river. Royal terns have a bright orange bill, black legs, and varying degrees of black feathers on their heads, depending on the season. Brown pelicans are large seabirds averaging four feet tall with more than a six and a half foot wingspan. They're most numerous along both the Atlantic and Gulf coasts of Florida, but have also been reported on inland waters like the St. Johns especially in lower basin waters from Palatka to Jacksonville. Brown pelicans are graceful, elegant flyers, often just skimming the surface of the water in formation with other brown pelicans. Fun fact, when they do this, they're taking advantage of an aerodynamic phenomenon called the ground effect or compression gliding. Basically, as the bird glides over the water, the air is funneled between the lower surfaces of the wings and the upper surface of the water. The air under the bird becomes more compressed and functions like a cushion of denser air that supports the bird aloft, resulting in more efficient energy-saving flight. Brown pelicans dive for their food, almost always fish, scooping them up in their stretchy pouches, sometimes along with gallons of water. Then they tip the pouch back to drain out the excess water and swallow the fish whole. When I was a kid, my mother used to say this goofy rhyme, pelican, pelican, beak holds more than his belly can. I always thought that was funny. Brown pelicans are one of only two species of pelicans in North America. The other one, the American white pelican, is even bigger than the brown pelican at over five feet tall with a wingspan of over eight feet and is more often seen in freshwater habitats like the upper St. Johns River Basin in Indian River, Brevard, and Osceola counties. Unlike brown pelicans, American white pelicans don't dive for their food but feed from the surface like ducks, dipping their bills into the water for fish and other aquatic organisms. Thank you so much for watching. We hope this video will help you identify and appreciate some of the wonderful birds of the St. Johns River. If you wanna learn more about birds and nature, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and check out our website at duvalaudubon.org. All audio recordings used in this presentation, courtesy of xenocanto.org.